Vicky Patterson. Everyone will have an idea of of who you are, but that's not who you are. It's just what you've done, isn't it? Yeah, I think quite often, um, especially in like this day and age, you are defined by what you have done, not who you are. Um, and I say quite a lot, like things that I've done in my past absolutely do not have to define me. Um, as human beings, we're under no obligation to be the same person we were sort of five years ago, five months ago, five weeks ago, even five minutes ago. I am that fickle. <laughs> so no, I, I think um, evolving and growing and all the rest of it, like it's a huge part. Um, and I appreciated that lovely introduction. I hope I don't let everybody down now. Ah, uh, <laughs> no, certainly won't. Listen, we always ask the, the same question to every guest. The first question, in your opinion, and this is not, for you know often people try and caveat this as well for me or well I'm not really sure this is purely for you what is high performance what do you feel high performance represents so for me if I was to consider like having a real oh I just did what you said everybody does as well that's just, that's just own it Vicky so own sweet. your definition of high performance yeah well high performance is <laughs> um, no so I think when I've had like a really good week and I consider I've had a very high performing week I've smashed my work goals you know I've managed to maintain good relationships with both my colleagues my agents everyone who I work with in that space I've gave a good amount of time to my friends and family and ultimately I feel happy and content and I go to sleep at night like that is a high performance week for me when I'm happy and content and I know I've done my best I love that answer, actually, Damien, because I think that there are still people that see this podcast from the outside and think, oh, it's about winning a World Cup. It's about being a billionaire. It's about owning a business. It's about being a, an entrepreneur or a founder. But actually, Damien, this podcast is about the world class basics that we can do every single day that simply just make us feel content and happy. That that definition from Vicky is really, I think, summing up what this podcast actually is about. Definitely. I think. High performance is high performance on your own terms, wherever you start from, and, and your own definition. In terms of the answer that you gave, Vicky, I'd, I'd, I'd ask you a question that readers of your new book were, uh, might appreciate it, but what number would you give today then? And would you explain <laughs> that coding system? Um, yeah, but also before I explain it, I'm going to hold my hands up straight away and say I can't take any credit for it. Like <laughs> it's my lovely life coach's kind of, it's his technique. Um, and I found it invaluable, actually, especially in the last couple of years. Since lockdown, weirdly enough, I've made a lot of changes in my life. Um, and sort of wanting to be able to have more balance was like right at the top of the list of things I wanted to change coming out of lockdown. So <clears throat> I used to think in order to be successful, every single one of my, I used to have to kill myself, basically. I used to think coming from the place I've come from, if anyone was going to take me seriously, I had to be the first one there. I had to know everybody's name. I was going to leave last. I was going to be respectful, polite. And I was going to do that every single day. There was no place for days off. There was no place for lateness and all of this. And like, I truly believed it. And actually it's so counterproductive to, to have that train of thought. Like all you do is burn yourself out. All you do is lose the love for anything that you are originally passionate about. Um, you become resentful, you slip, because we're all human. We can't go on like that forever. So Bill, my life coach, he taught me about numbering me days. And basically those days that I just described to you, you know, getting up in the morning, doing breakfast telly, going straight from there to radio, from radio to a record of something else, from that to a big event. You get home, 12 o'clock, you're knackered, your feet hurt, you're tired, but you know you've had a great day, you've smashed it. That is a number four day. It's high octane, it's stressful, it's big. You are getting like, you're getting a buzz from it. It's amazing, but it's hard. It's hard going and you have to take that into consideration. And then after that, you've got your day threes. So... That is, say, like a couple podcasts, maybe you're on Lorraine, um, you might have like a little photo shoot in the afternoon. Still quite stressful, you know, but not nonstop pressure, 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 but it still takes it out of you. Then your day twos, maybe you don't leave the house. Maybe you've just got some Zooms in the morning and a podcast in the afternoon. You fit in a nice dog walk, Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt, it's a good day. But then you've got your day ones and these are the days that I absolutely live for. And they are like 
days where you turn your phone off, you have a digital detox. You watch like back to back Emily in Paris, which again, I'm sure is not something your listeners normally watch. But <laughs> oh, man, don't you worry. My wife, <laughs> my wife was in bed the other day. She went, I don't believe it. It's only 10 episodes. I've got to the end already. <laughs> <laughs> she went through Emily in Paris hair. like a hot knife through butter. Yeah. <laughs> We've all, we've all been there. I quite liked it as well. <laughs> it's just so romantic. We've all got it, didn't we? Um, but no, and like you, de- you wear face mask and you play with the dog and you just give in to all of the foods that you haven't been eating that week and all of the things you probably haven't been doing and you just totally chill and recharge. And that is, it is important in life to have a mixture of these days if when you it comes to having a number four day you're going to be the best bright shiny positive brilliant version of you you can't do it if you haven't had your number ones so to answer your question today was meant to be a number one but more often than not at the moment they tend to fall in they tend to just squish into the number two category so it's it's been an, an, a surprise number two but i've loved it nonetheless <laughs> Can we talk about the the journey from where it all started to sitting on a high performance podcast, talking about numbering your days and success and commitment and hard work and all the things you're discussing? Um, Because you started this podcast by talking about the fact that we all change, we all grow all the time, everything's a journey. I'm really interested to know when the big change happened for you. Um, And you talk in your book, and it is a really interesting book. I'd encourage anyone to read it. You talked about the fact that from the outside when you were kind of coming through and you're on Geordie Shore and everything seemed great and you were like emerging as a celebrity horrible word but that's what was happening you actually weren't authentic and you weren't good to be around and you weren't really enjoying things like when did you decide that that was not the Vicky Patterson you wanted to be and that actually this what we're seeing now is is where you wanted to get to um I th- The change in me from being like this young, really excited girl who was plucked from absolute obscurity and put on a reality TV show um, into being like the Vicky Patterson people saw on Geordie Show happened so gradually that initially I didn't notice and I got really swept up and carried away with it. You've got to think I was like early 20s and I was so overwhelmed and and just did not have the tools at all to navigate the new the new politics of the world I was in and <clears throat> that feeling of like powerlessness and being out of me depth it manifested itself in some really ugly traits um and I became defensive and aggressive and angry and even more than that like I became this caricature of what I thought everybody wanted this really bolshy Geordie girl and like don't get us wrong there are elements of me definitely within that person we saw on that show Christ I'd be lying if I said you know I, I, I haven't got a like, quick tongue and a bit of a temper sometimes but I lost myself totally and like I say it was gradual but there was some pivotal moments um, <clears throat> where I realised I was basically sacrificing respect for attention like what, for example, Vicky? Um, so, I feel really bad saying this to two fellas, but like, I don't know why. Um, I had sex on the telly, and it's not anything that anyone doesn't know. Um, I've talked about it candidly for a while now, um, but it took us a long time to be able to discuss it because it was so out of character for me. I didn't grow up in a naked house. Like I grew up in a house where like you went in the bath and like you got dried and then you put your jammers on and then you came out the bathroom, you know, like we weren't uh, striding around the house in your towel type. So I was a bit of a prude. And like, I knew everyone else on the show was doing it. And I kind of felt pressure um, to be that person. And um, it drove a huge wedge between myself and my mum and she is a huge inspiration to me and one of my best friends and a really positive influence. So that that in itself was was really traumatic. Um, <clears throat> but also like I got a lot of stick, I got a lot of abuse, I got a lot of grief. Um, and it, it was really difficult to undo that once I'd done it, mm. to be seen as something else once I'd been seen as one thing. 
Yeah. And sometimes I still think, you know, doesn't matter how many jungles I'm the queen of and how many kitchens I smash and how much charity work I do, to some people I will still be that person. But when you look back on that time now, Vicky, like, can, can you spot warning signs that in hindsight you go, if it had been switched on there, I could have avoided losing myself? Yeah. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> I think, so in my opinion, I'm 34 now and I was 22 when I first got found for Geordie Shaw. And there's a reason there's not a lot of 34 year olds in shows like Geordie Shaw. Because if someone said to me now, everyone else is shagging, I'd be like, so what? So what? Like I'm not. But back then, you know, in your 20s, when you're so, you're so like insecure anyway, and you just want to be like everybody else and you're full of like crippling, crippling self-doubt, like that, that sentiment, like it, it, it gets in your head. And the, I think shows like Geordie Shaw, shows like Love Island, all of these huge juggernauts, which we're all a little bit obsessed with, don't get me wrong. Like they have a, a specific type of person that they want in them. And more often than not, they are young and they are naive and they are probably a little bit desperate to be famous. And all of those things can make you incredibly malleable. And that's what I was. I was malleable. And there are moments looking back where I say, think to myself, that producer wasn't really your friend or you could have behaved better there or you should have demanded a break. Like, you know, various things, but uh, hindsight's a lovely thing, isn't it? Like, sure. so I was too close to it at the time. I couldn't say the, couldn't say the wood for the trees. But what I'm interested in though, Vicky, is that anyone listening to this now that maybe are not in the same situation of, being having cameras foisted upon them as they live in their life, but where they, like, there's a lovely description in your book that I found really relatable when you describe returning back to Newcastle from Liverpool University and you had that head full of dreams of going down to London and living a life like Carrie Bradshaw and <laughs> and then, but then gradually you say you got a job back in the clothes shop and 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 that dream started to get diluted and that's the bit that I'm interested in of how like what advice would you give to our listeners about keeping that dream alive and not compromising yourself I mean I did come back from uni and like I I think I for the first I was I, I describe it in the book as being like the most uninspired I've ever been and the least ambitious um, and I can see why like yeah, home comforts are lush especially when you've been like Nick and toilet roll for three years. It's absolutely brilliant to like have a full spice cupboard and sort of know your fridge is always going to be fully stocked. So I get it. Like there's no judgment here from me. Comfort zones are like safe and by very nature comfortable, you know, but I had this and this is this analogy, right? And your comfort zone, imagine your comfort zone is an island and you, it's perfectly nice, but it's quite small you know, and you know all the fish already and you kind of know where the good coconuts are, but there's nothing else for you there. And off in the distance, you can see this other island and it's so like, you don't know anything about it. Like it could be bigger. It could have like new wicked fish. It could have like amazing fruit on the trees. Like you just don't know. And one day you set off swimming because you think it's got potential and you have to like, you owe it to yourself to check it out. But then the sky gets dark and the seas get choppy and you get scared. So you go back to your tiny island in the coconuts that you know, because that's what feels safe. But if you're always sitting on your tiny island with your little coconuts and the fish you know, you're never gonna grow. You're never gonna see what's on the other island and you're never gonna unlock all this amazing potential and possibility. And ah, Loads of times in my life have wanted to be on that other island, but I've been dead scared. But every time I've pushed through that storm, something amazing has happened. And it's dead easy to go back to the little island because I've done it loads as well. And I'd, again, like I, I'm not having a go at anyone who's happy there. But fuck me, when you do eventually get to that next island, it's absolutely class. And everything you thought is actually on it. So I would just say to people, push through the storm, man. <laughs> and what are the tools that you use to push through? Because... Look, we're proud of the impact this podcast has had, but it's not about listener figures or any of that sort of ego-related stuff. It's the messages we get every single day from people. 
who yeah. say that they're lost or they're struggling or they've got issues in their personal life or they're not sure which way to turn or the biggest one is they know where they want to go but the fear is what's stopping them what are the tools that you found worked for you for for just taking that leap and being brave and bold um so you have to like you have to love yourself like you have to properly believe you deserve everything it is you want and that is really hard to do because i don't think like i don't think we're I don't know it's just so hard it is really difficult to get into that mindset of respecting yourself and putting yourself first and making your goals a priority and all that sort of stuff but the minute you say to yourself like I deserve x y and z a partner who loves me someone who respects me a job that makes me happy a nice house whatever it is like you switch your mindset and things certainly like suddenly become more achievable and like I sent I think it's probably manifesting in a way um but like that, that to me would, like that to me was a huge game changer. Like in my twenties, I had such low self-worth. It's why I did a lot of the things I did, surrounded myself with the people I did um, and compromised who I wanted to be because I didn't have much respect for myself. But as I got older, I, I wanted more for myself. And I found out like the more time I invested in me, the better things came. Does that, so what sort of so, I mean I mean that's a brilliant answer. So again I'm thinking about the translatability of it. So like what was it that you did? Where did you go to? Who who did you seek out to to help you formulate those questions? Oh loads of people. God, if anyone thinks I just woke up one day and changed from like Vicky Jordy short of this person, they'd be absolutely mental. Like I have therapists, I have a life coach. I have a brilliant relationship with me mum. I've got like the same group of mates I've had since I was about 12 years old, them lasses. And they're constantly there for us as a brilliant soundboard. That not only helps keep me realistic and humble, but also it's like my biggest cheerleader does. Um, I've got a personal trainer who honestly is more like a therapist, bless him. He has all of me woes. <laughs> so I get to work out for the mind and the body whenever I go and see him. I've got the biggest support structure of people around us who have who've helped me realise all these things. Which leads us then to, to discuss a technique that, again, you describe in your book, The Secrets Are Happy, about compartmentalising people into, into, into three types. You, I'll let you describe it, because I think, I think it'll be a really helpful understanding of how people can maybe think about their own, their own circle. Like there's that saying, isn't there? Where it's you, you become the five people you spend the most time with or you become really like them. And I don't know if it's true or not, but like it kind of makes sense to me. If like you're surrounded by people who are miserable and negative and always whinging and think the world owes them a favor, like it's gonna rub off on you. It absolutely is. So if you surround yourself by with like positive pigeons and real high achievers and people who just love life, that is gonna rub off on you too. So. Yeah, I think how you spot these people, and again, I can't take credit for this. I'm coming across as such a thief on this podcast. Like, I just steal everybody's <laughs> no, great good. ideas. That's the idea. <laughs> There's but no such can... thing as an original idea, by the way. We're yeah. all learning from everybody else. <laughs> well, I like that. It makes me feel less guilty. Um, but yeah, I steal all my stuff from Damien. He's a professor. <laughs> He's a professor. I'm a former kids TV presenter, right? There is a serious disconnect there. <laughs> oh, but you just compliment each other so well. <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh, right. So there's three types of people in life, and there are, and you can work out who they are by how you feel when they ring your phone. Um, so you have people who, when you see their name like flash up on your display screen, you think, oh, for fuck's sake, <laughs> you know, like, and you know, like, as I've said this to you, everybody listening to this will know that person instantly. <laughs> um, and it's the person who, you know, they're ringing you probably because they want something or because they want to have a whinge or because like they need a favour they need you to get you into this nightclub or they want you to look after their kids. They just want something from you <laughs> and you never feel like it's a two way street. Like you don't mind picking up your pals who are always there for you, but this isn't that person. And they are called the draggers. 
they are like if you said to them oh I'm thinking about um, starting a new diet I'm going to try and be really healthy 2022 they'd be like mm, what are you going to do that for you'll only end up you'll only end up ruining it <laughs> you'll only end up eating loads of cake and I think right okay you are a negative influence on, on me they are the draggers we don't want those in my life really okay next you've got like the middle of the road as so when they ring you sort of think hmm should I answer? Should I not? Okay, I'll give them, you know, I'll pick up. They don't set your world on fire. They're perfectly nice. Like, if you said to them, oh, I'm going to try and eat more healthily, they'd be like, good for you. Good for you. You can do that. But they're perfectly pleasant. We shouldn't, like, we shouldn't be dismissive of them. Their hearts are in the right place. And then you have the igniters. This is who we should all strive to be. The kind of person that when you see their name pop up on your, on your screen, you can't wait to answer. You grin from ear to ear. Your whole body fizzes with excitement because you know they're ringing with something. Let's go on holiday. Well done for this. I'll eat healthy with you as well. They inspire you. They lift you up. They make you, they make you buzz like an old fridge. You're just fucking thrilled that they're in your life. And I feel like... Those are the people who you should have around you as, as much as you can. And I know... They make you buzz like an old fridge. <laughs> I, mean, I like that one. Yeah. Thank you. But that is, that is it. And I know we can't have a life full of, full of igniters, you know, we can't have a friendship circle full of them. Like potentially that might be quite flammable and dangerous, but the rest, like... The majority of your friends, your, your close circle, your colleagues, whatever, they should be those type of people. There's so much to unpack there. I mean, when I, when I originally read it, I, I was reminded of the work of a guy called uh, David Cantor, who's a psychiatrist that, that studied sort of group dynamics. And what you might be interested in, Vicky, is that um, his work was used to create the four main women characters of uh, Sex in the City. Honestly? So, yeah, so he talks about, like, he uses a slightly different language than your igniters and draggers and middle of the road. As he talks about, uh, you have initiators, are your igniters, you have blockers, are your draggers, you have the fourth group are the detached, they just mm-hmm. don't care. But then the middle of the roaders are what he calls um, the... Um, sorry, I forgot the name. Uh, the adapters. Right. These are people that can be influenced either way. Okay. So what I'm interested in there, though, is that so it's not a dissimilar pattern, but how do you determine then who, who, who gets access to you? Because as you say, people can change those dynamics at different times or different stages of their lives. So how do you, yeah, so I'm repeating myself. No. But how, like, I, so how do you determine who gets access to you and what kind of feedback do you give them? And just tell us a little bit about how you manage those groups. So it's a super fine balance. Like you say, if I'm preaching here about how much evolving and growth I've done, like I'd be pretty hypocritical to not allow like the people in my life to experience the same and treat them accordingly. Um, And also like I'm loyal as a dog. So I give it the big in about cutting people out of my life, but actually like I'm very soft and soppy. And I tend to just try and get a little bit of distance between me and people who potentially aren't good for me. Um, So no, I'm, I'm, very loyal and a very good friend and I will trust people and have them in my life until they until they threaten my peace um, and I haven't always been like that like I used to constantly be surrounded by toxic people again low self-worth but now that I view myself differently and put like and, and have things I want to achieve and I'm really serious about it and all that sort of stuff like I think the people I spend my time with are very important and you know when you don't get a lot of free time it's, it's really important who you choose to spend your time with, isn't it? So, no, I'm choosy. I'm definitely more choosy and I'm more protective of my peace. Um, but, like, I'm still a bit soft. Like, I'm still learning that one as well because um, I'm, I'm just too loyal for my own good. And what about how you act around and with other people? Because I think often we, we, we put people in these categories and we look at our friends, but what about ourselves? Like, do you, do you try and be an igniter? 24 oh, yeah. 7 and light up the, oh, I say to my kids every day we drop them off at school the final thing we say Harry and my wife is hey kids be the light in the room oh. and I guess that is like the igniters really you know I want them to be the ones where every kid goes I want to sit next to Seb and Flo in the classroom <laughs> you know no but like I'm sure they do and and that like I always endeavour to be an igniter you know the type of person who's like oh my god you're pregnant I'll throw you a baby shower I'm so excited and like whatever it may be that my friends are going through, I'm their biggest cheerleader and always their shoulder to cry on. Um, I always 
just want to be the friend I'd want to have. That's who nice. I endeavour to be. So, yeah, I'm an igniter most of the time, but I still have me down days where it can be a right pain in the arse. <laughs> this, um, this conversation sort of keeps on reminding me of something we talk about often on this podcast, Vicky, which is fault versus responsibility. We talk often that there are things that happen in all of our lives that are not necessarily our fault, but it's still our responsibility to deal with it. And I think that it's very easy for someone from the outside to look at some of your behaviour on Geordie Shaw or the way you acted around that time and think, well, of course it was her fault. She was acting like an idiot. She was doing stupid things. But actually, when you, and it, in my line of work, it's like this with young footballers. We expect so much of young people and people expected so much of you that they would put you in a totally alien environment and then you would swim. Well, you know what? They probably put you there because they knew you wouldn't and it was going to be interesting watching you not do that. You don't see it at the time, do you? But the responsibility is something that feels like it's now arrived with you. So do you, do you subscribe to this mindset that we try and subscribe to on this podcast of 100% responsibility? So even though there are things happening every day that are not your fault, it's still your responsibility to work out how to deal with it. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, it would be dead easy for me to say I was really young. Um, I was pressured. It was this X, Y, and Z. I didn't have the chills and all the rest of it. And I think to a certain extent, that is in fact true. But the fact of the matter is, it was still me doing those things. And I honestly believe, like, you can't help what happens to you in life sometimes. But you absolutely can determine and control how you deal with those things. Yes. So for a long time, I didn't cope with them well. I didn't deal with them well. I didn't have the tools to be this better person. Um, but now, yeah, I, I do have them. And I am still paying for a lot of the mistakes and things I did back then. Mm. Um, but In what way? So I think it's really hard for someone from reality TV to try and transition into a different space and be taken seriously. Um, I always use this analogy like of David Beckham trying to be an actor. And like, I feel really bad because I liked him in that Sword and the Stone film. I thought he was great. <laughs> and he only had that one line. And I thought if that was anybody else, nobody would have batted an eyelid. He would have just been like cameo. But because it was David Beckham, everyone was ripping him apart. And I thought, why can't David Beckham be good at more than one thing? Why did he just have to be a footballer? Why, like, why wouldn't you give him that chance, you know? So it's kind of similar. There's this, like, almost like a misconception um, that if you're on a reality TV show, you are talentless, unintelligent, vapid in some way. And, like, there's been loads of things that I've wanted to do. Like, I wanted to do The Jungle for years before I was given a chance to do it, you know? And I had to fight. I had to break down their door. <laughs> um, and there's loads of other stuff, you know? Shows I've wanted to do, places I've wanted to go, books I've wanted to write. And then I have had to fight for, because nobody thought a girl from Geordie Shaw was capable of that. And I still want to do other things. So I'm still trying to break down, like, those kind of misconceptions and preconceived notions of me and reality TV stars in general to make it possible. So I think I do still pay for my behaviour a little bit, <laughs> but at least I own it. See, what fascinates me there, Vicky, is that I'm reminded as you're saying that, I don't know if you've ever seen Jay Shetty. Um, I love him. Or, or if, you, if you've seen his stuff where he talks about, like, so often in life that people have a perception of us and we almost respond to how we think they perceive us. Yeah. If that makes sense. It so, does. So how do you not act down to the preconceptions that you fit, that you that you're assuming people have of you? How like how do you break that cycle? I like to surprise people me. I like to shock people. Um I think uh they can have any idea of me they want. Anyone can assume whatever they like about Vicky Patterson, you know? But and, and you can dislike us even. I, I'm, I'm not going to please everyone, you know? I can't, it's not possible. But I challenge anyone to like meet me or sit down and chat with me or whatever and still walk away hating us. Like, I think if people come to me with like a really low opinion of us, like all I can, all I can do is improve on that, isn't it? So I, I don't mind really, like if someone has these sort of preconceived notions, like I will eventually change your mind no matter how long it takes us. 
And whether that takes me like grafting for 20 years, whether that takes me learning everybody's name in a room, whether that takes me being the first person there and being the last person there, whatever it takes, like I will get there. I love that. I mean, it's a real sense of resilience. And I think the important thing to remember here is that what is bad for you isn't necessarily, or what is hard for you isn't necessarily bad for you. So there would have been times in the last decade or so when you've had really hard times, but you're now reaping the benefits because they've given you the resilience. If I, if I was to ask you, what was the, what was the lowest point in this whole journey um, that, that you feel has helped to give you the resilience that you rely on today? Which point would you go to? There's some, there's some strong contenders. I'm not going to lie. There's like, I could podium place them, I think. Um, there's this one moment that sticks out. Um, and uh, it's like so still really painful for us to talk about because it's just so far removed from whoever I've ever been, you yeah. know. Um, Do you mind talking about it? No, God, no. Um, it's in it's in my book. It's it's no secret. So um, I'm more than happy to discuss it with you, lads. Um, I broke up with someone who was also on the show, and the relationship had been incredibly unhealthy and super toxic and dead tempestuous, and it was for the best. But it, it's still a breakup, you know, and um, it hurts, and you need time to heal and all of that. So I remember he'd. He hadn't, he'd been asked to leave the show and I continued on and I filmed a series in Australia and I felt like it was so important that I gave it me all and showed that I was like this strong, single, happy girl again. And I did, I smashed it, but it exhausted us. It just took everything I had to put on that facade for so long, about three months. And when I came home, I was assured oh, we're going to give you a good break. That series has done great. Everyone's like loving it. You would think you deserve some time off. And I booked some holidays with my mates and I arranged to spend time with my mum and I just wanted to rest and recuperate and get over that breakup, you know. And uh, MTV got back in touch and said, like, the success of that series had been unprecedented. I don't know why I didn't see it coming, quite frankly. Foolish. Um, but they needed another one. And I said, oh, I've you promised us I could have time off. I've got holidays booked and I wanted to do this and X, Y, and Z and I, I need time. Like, this was before, you know, we were all saying my mental health is bad. But basically that was what I was insinuating. Um, and they just were like, that's fine. Take your time off. It's all right. We'll just replace you. And um, I know, and I was so scared. Like now I would say, well, go for it. There's only one Vicky Patterson. But, you know, and like then I was like, oh, well, I'll come back. And I was in the worst possible place. And I was like, as close to broken as I've ever been. Just knowing that they thought so little of me, having like broken up with me ex, like all of these things were like catching up with us. I was exhausted, I was drained. I didn't like my body, I was drinking too much, all of these things. And um, I got into a big fight in a nightclub. And uh, I, I hurt somebody and it was awful. And um, I had a, a really long six month court case that ended in um, ended in us getting community service and all these sort of things um, that I really deserved. And um, after that, like I was asked to I was asked to leave the show for a while, and I had a, I was trying to like work like I just was so lost, you know, like I was so angry because I thought. I knew something like this was coming. You knew something like this was coming, Vicky. You didn't know what it was, but you knew you were at breaking point and you allowed yourself to be pushed into a situation that you knew you weren't comfortable in. And that was like a huge, the lowest I've ever felt in terms of like feel, like self-worth, career, being lost, being powerless, feeling like I actually hated myself actively because of what I'd done. Um, and also the most confused because how could I go on working for a company that put me in that position and then when I was there just hung us out to dry? So that's the, the big one, I think, lads. And it's still clearly still painful today. Yeah, like, how do you get over that, you know? Yeah. Like, I was, like, front, front page of loads of papers and I was a monster and I was this and I was that and I was everything that was wrong with today's youth and what hurt us the most is that was a part of us that absolutely agreed. So if you were in that position now then, Vicky, what would you do differently? And when would you do it differently? Um, if I'd have asked for a break, I 
regardless of what their answer was, I would have took it. If I knew I needed it, like even today, I caught myself before, babe, like being a little bit stressed this afternoon, thinking this was meant to be a day off, Vic, and it's not a day off anymore, is it, you know? And I thought, I'm going to message my agent and just say, I need some time off next week. I'm starting to become like not a great version of me. And I don't want to sit and have amazing opportunities like this, but not be in the right place for them. Like, I don't want to be successful at the detriment of my sanity and health. So what would you do, though, if if somebody still gave you that same message of you know what Vicky we'll replace you don't worry don't do it we'll get somebody else to take on how would that be processed differently for you today than maybe 10 years ago um don't don't get us wrong like it would still hurt I think hearing that you're replaceable is such a cruel thing for anyone to say and I'm I'm such a fanny so yeah it would hurt I'd, I'd be sad but I've got more respect for myself and like more confidence in what I'm building and who I am and what I bring to the table than to, you know to be like oh god okay sorry let me do it and fall in line I'd say well go on fill your boots you this was a mistake um but I'd be scared I would be scared I'd be sassy but scared right <laughs> and it's it's a it's a great place to get to to be able to make that decision because it's so hard, I think, in the modern era, particularly with social media, because you'll go on there and see everyone else having their, revealing their edited lives to you and showing you how great everything is. And one of the things I really like, um, and when I knew we were interviewing you, I started to follow you on Instagram. I really love like the, the honesty. I just, I'll share a little bit for people that listen to this podcast and don't follow you. You, you put out a social media post saying that you were going to wake up and it was the start of 2022. Everything was going to be great and fantastic. And then you say you were actually were a bit scared. You didn't feel like yourself. And then this really nice bit here, you said the urge to keep this to myself, pop on some gym gear and jump on Instagram with some quote about this year being my year, acting like everything was fine is almost too strong. And, you know, I think particularly for parents like us with very young children who are not yet in this world of social media and Instagram, it's scary and it's quite worrying for us. What advice would you give um, for how young, how anyone actually can protect themselves on, on social media, a platform where we're comparing our own lives to other people's edited version of? There's a saying that I wasn't allowed to use in my book because it's somebody else's and they're very precious and I don't blame them because it is a good one. Um, but it is like, don't compare your behind the scenes to someone else's highlight reel. And I, I don't think it was created for social media, but it's, there's just never been a better way to describe it. It's so apt. We are constantly bombarded with unrealistic images of perfection. And um, for a while, like I completely was suckered in. And even worse than that, I perpetuated that culture, which I've grown to hate. It's easily done, but it's so toxic. And I couldn't even keep up with it. You know, the, like the pressure I was putting on myself to be something I wasn't. And I was like, well, in my 20s. So I do worry about like young lasses and young lads coming to these platforms and thinking everything they see is as is, because it's not. Everything's filtered. And everything is this carefully curated glimpse into somebody's life. They're showing you what they want you to fucking see. They're not showing you their bad days, their breakouts, their periods, their hangovers, the days when they just can't bring themselves to look in the mirror. Like they're not showing you any of that. They're showing you the highlights. So take it with a pinch of salt and don't be afraid to block people who threaten your peace. I block people all the time. It's like up there with one of my favorite things to do. I like sneezing and I like blocking people. This is like in terms of free things, by the way. So all right. So, <laughs> so I want total honesty then. Do you still apportion um, any self-worth or any self-confidence to the likes you get on social media or the comments going, Vicky, you look amazing today? Ooh, right. Ah. Oh, I feel like I, this makes me feel like less of an evolved person, but the answer is definitely yes. Mm. It's so hard when such a big portion of my life is consumed by it. It's how a lot of how I make money these days, you know? So <clears throat> uh, it, it's difficult to not be obsessed with it to a certain extent, but I do have certain practices put in place to try and stop us being, like stop my self-worth being so hinged on it. Um, 
regular digital detoxes like like I say you know blocking people this that and the other I like to put a post on and walk away sometimes rather than being like sitting and staring at it and and, I don't know just becoming consumed by it um so no to answer your question honestly it's a bigger woman than me who hasn't who's got the hang of social media totally I I don't think though that anyone that says oh I don't care about likes and shares and positive comments I'm not sure that they're telling the truth because I think that if you actually look at it all that is is a reflection of society if I said to you do you like it when you go to a party people say you look good well of course you do do you like it when you go to a, an event and everyone wants to take your photo of course you do well it's, exa- it's exactly the same but Instagram is just like a digital version of that I think the key here is for all of us to perhaps take responsibility I mean that's why I love it when you put photos up of yourself with no makeup on at all because, you know, I don't want little Florence to see just Instagram as everyone looking amazing. And she already goes to these dance classes, does all these like ridiculous poses, which worries me enough. Um, <laughs> because I, I think that it's not good for other people. But I think you're a really good example as well of someone where it clearly wasn't good for you to only be looking perfect 24-7. I, I wonder how, do you remember the moment you decided to share something on Instagram where you were like, right, I'm actually just going to show the real me and how liberating that felt? Or was it? scary what was the what was that journey like i think it happened organically um if i can remember correctly and like i i had a hard year a couple years ago i had a relationship breakdown and i lost my best friend and i lost my grandma like within like rapid succession and um i just felt exhausted by like the emotional turmoil and um i i didn't have the energy to be that like strong, sassy, positive person on social media, that that image that I'd projected for so many years. And um, I just started speaking from the heart, really organically about me heartbreak, me grief, feeling lost. Um, And it spiraled from there because I did get a really positive response. And like, it's like you say about the messages you guys get about the podcast, like listens are amazing. Downloads are incredible. And yes, they give you validation, a boost, they give you validation. But what means the most to me is when someone says, I let my daughter follow you on Instagram and you're one of the only celebrities I do. Or I was going through a break, like I was going through a bad time with me fella and I thought I had to stay with him, but you made me realize I could walk away. Like this sort of thing. And, and that's what happened off the back of my makeup free posts, my honest posts. And I suppose I got addicted to that feeling that I was actually doing something with my platform. Do you think there's something as well about that we're hardwired in society not to follow hypocrites? So if you think like politically, you know, like whenever, say recently, the scandal about the prime minister, and it's not that he had the party it's the fact that he was telling everyone else not to have parties and things like that and that's where the outcry comes from of hypocrisy do you feel that starting to be authentic has led to very different results for you in all the aspects of your life then yeah like I definitely noticed a shift like when you're being so honest and so authentic things are just easier like how drained are you when you have to go and meet your in-laws man and like you have to put on this like version of you that's and I, I don't care how long you've been married to your partner you're always trying aren't you to make a good impression like you come home and you're like fucking knackered <laughs> but like when you just let it all hang out and you are this like just genuine version of you it's when you're around your best mates it's so easy it's good for your soul you're happier they're happier in your company you're more relaxed things just flow and it's the same with life Like when you stop trying to be something you're not or stop trying to live up to other people's perceptions of what you should be, you just get to be you and things fall into place. And it's so good. Since I started being me, like I've like really me, I found a nice partner. I've got a nice house. I love the work I'm doing. I've got a very naughty dog who's also lovely, but I'm just happy, mate. The happiest I've ever been. So yeah. Which leads me, like, can I ask you about the hero of your book, your sister, Laura? <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit that when I read it, I laughed out loud when you described you, you were offered her a three week holiday in Australia when you were doing the I'm a Celebrity programme and her response was, fuck that. What would I want to go there for? And 
she just seems very grounded and honest, Vicky. And I'm wondering, what's the best piece of advice she's given you over the last 10 years that you still remember and you'd want to pass on today? Um, first of all, Laura would absolutely love you too. Um, <laughs> she's, she's, she is, her and my mom are like two of the best influences in my life. They keep, my mom keeps me like uplifted and positive and excited and Laura keeps me like grounded and she, she's loyal. So yeah, so they're great. Um, best advice. Like, you know, Laura's always, used to always tell me when I'd come home with like, when I'd, because she was always the person I'd run to when something would go wrong with a boy or something would go wrong with my agents or something would happen, something bad in the pressures, always the person I'd run to. And she'd always just say it, it was like, you, ne- you need to know your worth. You need to know your worth. And like, I didn't for so long. And that's why I went out with horrible people. And that's why I didn't have the people with like the best, me best interests looking after us. It's why I took wrong jobs, why I stayed in situations longer than I should. But like now, eventually I do know me worth. And it's not big headed. Like I don't think I'm like anything special. I just know who I am and what I'm not willing to put up with. And subsequently, everything in my life is like healthier for it. Relationships, work, professional ones, everything. So yeah, Laura does really know our stuff, but I hope she doesn't listen to this and get a big head. <laughs> <laughs> so if I said to you, who is Vicky Patterson today? What answer comes back at me? Um, I am a... Oh my God, that's so hard to answer. So like if I was explaining it to like an alien, who I am? <laughs> um, Maybe. Okay. I am a TV star, an author, a kind of modern feminist. Like, I'm not burning my bra or anything, but I really just want ladies to be happy doing whatever it is that makes them happy. So I think that makes me a feminist. I'm happy, comfortable, confident enough in my own skin. Um, and I'm not finished growing and evolving, but I'm dead happy with where I'm at right now. Is that a good answer? It's a great answer. (laughs) And the the, the bit that interests me though, is the evolution still. We're all a work in progress. What are the things that you still really look at and think that is is still my Achilles heel? That is still the thing that I can make out I've solved, but I absolutely haven't. Like I I had this ex-boyfriend who always used to say to me, you think, Everyone thinks you're Vicky from the jungle, but I know you're Vicky from Geordie Shore. And like, that is a sentence that like has stayed with me. How does it make you feel? It's, it is, it's my biggest fear. It's my biggest Achilles heel, is that no matter how hard I try to be this better person, deep down I am that girl. It terrifies us. And every so often when I'm quick to anger or I um, don't treat people with the respect I think they deserve, I think you're regressing, you're her, and I, I hate myself for it. So I'm still working very hard to let go of that fear and that, that, that guilt and that self-doubt, you know? Yeah, and look, I, I don't know, I doubt your ex-boyfriend listens to this, but whether it's him <laughs> or someone else, can we all just understand that life is not permanent? Everything passes, everything's temporary. And when you were Vicky Patterson on Geordie Shore, that is what you were. But in 2022, this is what you are. And it's about time that we embrace the fact that growth is a thing we should all be inspiring in each other. And I think it tells you everything you need to know about the person that you're obviously no longer with, that he, the one thing he wanted you to do was not grow by constantly reminding you and basically saying, you can't grow, you can't change, you can't improve. You'll always be that. I mean, you know, thank goodness he went by the wayside. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like that was it. People who say those type of things, they're trying to keep you small. They're intimidated by your light. Oh, I realise that now. But thank you so much for your kind words. You two are so lovely. Thanks well, for having thank us, man. <laughs> Thanks for coming I, on. I was so nervous. Oh, you've been brilliant. It's what were you nervous brilliant. about? This isn't my usual podcast. I'm not your usual person. And I just thought, oh God, I hope I'm what they need me to be. I hope I do myself oh. justice. No, so this is good then. Thing. We now know that your imposter syndrome is still alive and well. <laughs> Yeah, just ticking that one off. So should we talk about that for a second? I mean, that's obviously still a work in progress, Vicky. Oh, God, absolutely, lads. But, like, you know how when, like, 
when you're in the industry I'm in and like you just walk in a, walking down this morning's corridors and like you bump into like Stanley Tucci like when do you when on earth do you ever get over that and think oh, I fucking deserve to be here with the Tucci like you don't you, I don't think I don't think I'm ever gonna accept the, the circumstances I found myself in totally and I don't know if I want to 110% because then wouldn't I just be really like too cool for school and over it. I like that I'm very excited and feel really grateful and lucky, but yeah, I do want to work on feeling more like I belong. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, can I just follow up with that? Because I think that, like the message you said about this isn't your usual type of podcast. There's something that when I was reading your book over the weekend and I was, I, I was reminded of that idea that we can learn from anywhere. And I think that's a powerful message for anyone that's listening to this that they might have preconceptions or they don't watch the type of programs that you've been on Vicky or they wouldn't necessarily pick up that book but I just found there was so much wisdom in it and you know you were so vulnerable and you were prepared to to share some of those techniques that I've got real value out of reading it and also speaking to you so thank you for for being so honest and, and vulnerable. That's so nice. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I, 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 I wear my heart on my sleeve, mate. I really do. Um, but that's always, I, I think, like, what we all just want to feel, like, is that we're not alone. Like, that is, I, whenever I share something on social media that I've been a bit nervous about sharing, whether it's, like, makeup-free or super emotive, or, like, really honest, like... I, I, when you share and you're, it's getting all I, all women want to feel like and men for that matter is that we're not going through things on our own we're not the only one who doesn't have it figured out so that was the whole point of the book I wanted to show it's okay to have a grazed knee and a bad chapter and a mistake because it's all part of life and you're not the only one yeah <laughs> Brilliant. We're all a work in progress, hey? Listen, Vicky, we always end these um, conversations with our quickfire questions. The first okay. one we've got for you is, what are the three, and this is a good one for you because you've obviously been someone that accepted bad people in your life because you felt you didn't deserve anything else and now you've managed to change. So the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you have to buy into, what do people need to bring to the table? Um, okay, so I want people to be positive, like, I want to be surrounded by positive people who are excited by life. Like, uh, whether it was friends or ex-partners or whatever, I've gone out with people who, like, they drag you down. Like, you never bring them up. Please, we are not re rehabilitation centres. You're never going to fix anybody. Like, be with people who are, like, strong, happy, know what they want. Be around those type of people because it'll just help you soar. So, yeah, so first one, I like to be surrounded by positive people. Um, second... I like to be around people who, who who respect your boundaries. Like some people over the years have just took from me and it's been a real like one way street. And because I think you accept the love you think you deserve when I potentially wasn't valuing myself very highly, like I allowed those relationships to go on far longer than they should. And um, again, like, you know, I, I never came out on top I never came out having made someone else better. I was always just broken by the end. So yeah, people have to respect your boundaries and you. Um, and finally, I'm um, extremely neurotic. I don't know if you've noticed, I'm a little bit, um, uh, so it's very nice to have people in my life who bring a bit of balance sometimes. Um, my partner, Erkan, uh, is very secure, very calm and very kind. And for years, like, I just thought I needed these, like, really toxic, loud alpha male types in my life if they were going to handle all of Vicky Parson, which is just such bollocks. Because <laughs> more often than not, the loudest man or woman in the room is often the most insecure. So I found for my personality, for who I am, people who are balanced kind calm supportive they they work really well for me so yeah balance is the final one if you could go back to any moment in your life what would it be and why um it would be it would be the it would be that moment where i told mtv i needed a break 
and I would take the break. I know there's loads to be said for, you know, the butterfly effect and would I still be the person I am now if I hadn't done it, but I just can't forgive myself for the way that played out. So I would have saved myself a lot of tears and I think I saved up my family a lot of heartache as well and that poor person. So yeah, I'd go back to then, mate. How important is legacy to you? Ooh, I've never thought of that. Um, I always say, like, I want to be remembered for the way I make people feel. So I suppose maybe I have, really. Um, I don't care how many followers everyone remembers I had or, like, how good I looked in a bikini or, like, what, what TV shows. I don't care. I care that people say she made me feel good about myself. She was kind. She was nice. If it's my friends, like, I want them to say she was a great friend and I loved her. If it's someone who follows us on Instagram, I want them to say, oh, she made me feel better about myself. She made me realise that cellulite's okay. That, that, that's what I want my legacy to be. What's the biggest sacrifice you've ever made for high performance? It was a misguided sacrifice. Um, I think. Um, but like one that was necessary, I suppose. Um, I kind of had to sacrifice my privacy. Um, the very nature of the beast that is reality TV is that no element of your life is off limits um and even though i haven't done it that that genre of tv in its purest form for quite some time mm. like that was all i knew in my adult life so it skewed my opinion of what is normal to share and what isn't and subsequently i'm like this like unhealthy oversharer all the time um and like even now I am in a position where my life could kind of be my own if I wanted it to be I still don't really understand the boundaries of it so yeah I suppose that so would you do it again I mean I'm so grateful for where I am now it's hard to say no and I really like who I'm becoming but at the same time if I could have got here via any other vehicle I would have op- I would have chose something else. Very good. And our final question. And um, look, yeah, we get a lot of um, sports fans and business CEOs and leaders listening to this, Vicky. But we also get loads of parents and an incredible amount of school teachers that listen to this, and they're just desperately trying to pass on lessons they've learned and affect the next generation in a positive way. And our final question to you is: What is your one golden rule? for being a high performer. And I guess in many ways, it's just your kind of, your final message really to those that are listening to this from the highs and the lows and the lessons that you've learned and the the days that you've stumbled and struggled and and you still managed to get back up. What would you like to leave people to think about? I would just tell people to start putting themselves first, which sounds like such a selfish note to end on, but we have to break that mindset. Like putting, like again, not my analogy, but Two people I really love told me this once. And it's like, you know, when the oxygen mask drops down on a plane and they tell you to put it on yourself first and your instant reaction is to save the people around you. Fair enough. You're a great person for that. But you will only save the person to your right and the person to your left. If you put your, your oxygen mask on, you can save that whole plane. And like, I think that's who I want to be like I want to look after myself and be the best version so I can in turn pay everything forward like you can't be the best mother the best CEO the best brother the best sports person if you're not looking after yourself first you can't pour from an empty cup so let go of the idea that looking after number one is in some way toxic or selfish and start doing it Thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's been an hour in the company of an igniter, hasn't it, Damien? Definitely. I feel energised on it already, so so you've already had an impact. Yes, Damien! Come on then, son! <laughs> I'm so happy about that. That is a really big compliment. Thank you so much, oh, guys. Amazing, thank you. And Vicky, you. honestly, really appreciate that. You know, there was no need to be nervous, was there? Because I think this is, a, this is actually perfect because it's a reminder to people that they can they can learn something from anywhere. You know, we had Susie Ma, an entrepreneur on here, saying that she watched a Disney film when she learned something from Disney. I mean, whenever I say to people, oh, just do the next right thing, I keep thinking, oh, I'm quoting Frozen. This sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but there is some strength in that. Just doing the next right thing can sometimes be good. And I, I really hope that people will 
look at this and think, Vicky Patterson, high, high performance. Mm. And by now they will think, yeah, you know what? This is a great reminder that we all have journeys and we all have lessons to impart. So I thank them for coming and listening, but I really thank you for coming and sharing. Oh. Well, thanks so much, lads. Today was like a prime example of me swimming through the storm to that next desert island. And I just want to let you know, your coconuts are bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Never been told that before. <laughs> Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community.